Hey, everybody. We were 10 minutes into an A-plus show when it turned out we didn't press that one button that you have to press so that you guys can actually see what was happening. So you'll just have to take my word for it that uh, we we're off to a great start. And we've pressed the button. Hopefully someone can see us. And let's go ahead and get started. And we'll run a few minutes over our normal time to make up for, I'm for our tomfoolery. All right. Hello, and welcome to the Weekly Space Hangout for Wednesday, March 6, 2019. My name is Morgan Renberg. Fraser and Paul are off in Costa Rica having a jolly good time pressing all the necessary buttons. Uh, but fortunately, with me, as always, uh, from EOS Magazine is Dr. Kimberly Cartier. Hey, hey, Kim. Hey, Morgan. Happy podcast day. Also joining Dr. Pamela Gay from the Planetary Science Institute. I am not Fraser. I apologize. I did not have button privileges. Yes, the button was my responsibility and I failed badly. Uh, this week, we're going to be talking about a shiny new mission uh, docked at the International Space Station. Uh, we're going to be talking about how we probably can't be Bruce Willis if that asteroid comes flying our way. Uh, way, way too many or too few Kuiper Belt objects. Uh, Kepler, a brand new shiny planet that's also really old. Uh, Insight, having a little trouble on the surface of Mars and a really awesome film about Apollo 11 that everyone is going to want to see. Uh, but before we get to any of that, we have an awesome special guest. And usually you just say that, but I know that Jeff is awesome because we've been talking for 10 minutes already. Uh, and we're going to take this try number two. Uh, so Jeff Morgenthaler from Chile, Maine. How are you? Uh, Maine is seven degrees right now, or... Yeah, still seven. Now, Pamela, I have to say I'm getting a very long delayed echo into my headset. So I don't know if that's something you can address. You have the YouTube window open somewhere. Find the YouTube window and kill it. Hunt okay, it down. thank you. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so, All right. So Jeff, you uh, study the solar system, uh, but Unlike a lot of guests that we have on this show, you're not attached to a NASA mission like InSight or Cassini. Uh, how are you looking out at the solar system? I use a telescope, and I actually use my objects to be a spacecraft. So what kinds of things are you looking at through that telescope? Well, probably the easiest and simplest thing to think about as a space probe, um, as far as solar system objects go, are comets. They are these things that produce lots of gas, but they don't have these complicating things like uh, magnetic field or gravity. So it's kind of like the limiting case of an atmosphere in the middle of space. And like, why do we care about what's between us and these other objects? You know, we spend a lot of time here on Earth trying to look down through the clouds and actually see the surface. You know, wouldn't we want to just kind of wish all that intermediate stuff away? Well, that might be nice for our space weather issues, like uh, knockout satellites and stuff like that. But we can't, um, you know, the, the sun puts off the solar wind, which you may have talked about on previous shows. Um, and that's actually a huge amount of material. And that interacts very strongly with atmospheres, magnetic fields, and even the surfaces of things like, you know, asteroids and, and small uh, airless bodies like Mercury that don't have much of atmosphere or magnetic field to protect them. So a couple months ago, we had the project manager from the James Webb Space Telescope on here. And we've talked uh, with other scientists who have used telescopes like Keck or looking forward to uh, the 30 meter telescope that's being put together now. I think when we think about telescopes, we often think of these sort of giant facilities, uh, but that's not what you're using, right? That's correct. Although a good telescope is...
Um, the telescope itself, no. The uh, the mount that I put it on is a, is a higher end thing, so it, it goes exactly where I tell it to. And then there's a special instrument on the back that um, puts something like sunglasses over, in this case, I'm looking at Jupiter. Sometimes I look at Mercury. And um, it cuts down the light from those very bright objects, some of the brightest objects in the sky, by a factor of a thousand, and lets me look at the diffuse gas clouds around those objects. Mercury makes a thing like a big comet tail blowing back from the sun. Uh, and uh, Jupiter has a big cloud of sodium coming off of its volcanic moon Io. And, and also this weird hula hoop thing called the Io Plasma Taurus. Yeah, so you just published a paper using this small telescope to, to study Io. Uh, what were you looking to find? Okay, so that, that was work that was supported by the NSF, um, five-year project, uh, looking to see what the response of Jupiter's magnetic field or magnetosphere, so not just the field, but the stuff in it too. The response of that to effectively blowing a bubble in it. So, you know, Jupiter's moon Io is the most volcanic body in the solar system, and it generally produces a, a steady stream of stuff. About one ton per second comes off of Io. But sometimes it produces a lot more. And that blows up this bubble of this large magnetosphere, which is surrounding Jupiter. And I want to study the response of that. And this one little telescope can actually measure both the amount of material coming off of the volcanoes and uh, what's going on um, inside the magnetic, uh, inside the magnetosphere, and tell me what I want to know. So Earth's moon uh, orbits basically outside of Earth's magnetosphere. Can you kind of paint a picture for us how big Jupiter's magnetosphere is and where Io is relative to that? Yeah, so so th I forgot the exact number, but you you, you see these these comparisons of scale, like uh, it, it's like a thousand times bigger than than um, uh, or more um, Jupiter's magnetosphere than than Earth's, and all of the um, well, I'd say well anyway, Io orbits six Jovian radii away from Jupiter. It's really close. It goes around once every day and a half. So it gets smacked by all this radiation environment. Uh, that's why it's kind of hard to study for spacecraft because, you know, spacecraft don't like to get smacked by radiation. Um, and uh, so that, um, uh, so, well, I think I answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you're using your telescope with this special filter on it to block out the glare of, of Jupiter. Right. How are you measuring uh, the material coming off of, of Io? Is this a picture you're taking, another kind of measurement? Yeah, I just take pictures. I, I take a picture using a, a very special filter, narrow band. It isolates just light from sodium, in this case, to look for the volcanic output that uh, sodium responds the quickest. Um, and, and then I took a, an off band picture, so a wavelength just a little bit different and I subtract the two and get rid of any excess glare. And, uh, then I make a movie just to check all my work. Uh, and then I take, um, apertures, just groups of pixels. And I sum them up and, um, and then I plot that as a function of time and I look for bumps. Uh, did you find bumps? I found a huge bump. In fact, it was so huge, I didn't believe it. Uh, you know, this is the first, I, I started the, the project in 2017 with observations, and I was trying to get the thing working. I'm the only one working on the project. And and um, finally, by the end of the, like July 2018, I'm reducing the data feverishly, and I see this big bump. I'm like, no, I, I just want to see it. This can't be and, and then I'm excited, and then, then I'm like, no, 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 it's this mistake. And, and I, I went through this oscillation for a couple of months that drove my family crazy. <laughs> so um, how do we interpret this larger-than-expected bump? Does that mean that there's more material coming out of Io's volcanoes than we expected? Um, this kind of thing has been seen before. Uh, the 
the last time we saw something that lasted this long was actually using um, the Galileo spacecraft. It had a dust detector, the Galileo dust detector, um, and it could tell based on this one and a half day orbit of um, Io and when it received these pulses of dust, what was coming from Io. And it's not like a factor of oh, like a thousand more dust uh, than um, it had, you know, like for about a six month period during the mission in 2000, I think it was. And, and then people have been monitoring by the technique I'm using, using the sodium cloud since that time, a Japanese group in particular. Um, and they've seen some things here and there lasted a few months, uh, but this is the largest or the longest anyway, uh, since uh, 2000, it lasted six months. And so have, Juno is, go ahead. Sorry, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cut in for a moment here. Uh, we have a question coming in from our audience asking us, uh, are there lightning strikes that go between Io and Jupiter? So do you see any interactions between these worlds other than the transfer of gas into the inner regions? Excellent question. And uh, what happens isn't, it's not exactly lightning, but um, because Jupiter has such a strong magnetic field, particles are trapped in that. I don't know, you'd have to kind of know that particles wind around magnetic fields in a spiral, okay? And so those particles that are trapped in magnetic field sort of bounce up and down between Jupiter's poles. And sometimes they go into the atmosphere of the pole and make aurora, okay? And when Io gets in the way of this material that's whizzing by at 57 kilometers per second, because Jupiter rotates every 10 hours, and uh, so that material sort of comes on the back of Io, which is only going around every day and a half, uh, that material bonks into Io and causes an excitement of the material along the magnetic field. And so that actually excites aurora on Jupiter's uh, surface, on the top of its atmosphere, that Hubble Space Telescope discovered a number of years ago. Uh, John Clark at, uh, at Boston University was the first one to see that. And um, now there's some great observations using the Juno spacecraft of those. Uh, you get this thing that looks like a dot and then a tadpole uh, trailing behind it. It's really an aurora type phenomenon, which is from these electrons that get excited and deposited. Uh, they, they get excited by bonking into Io and then uh, deposit their energy into Jupiter's atmosphere. So it's not exactly like so I was wondering about uh, Juno. So Juno has been orbiting Jupiter now for a couple of years. Are, are you able to connect what you're seeing with the kinds of measurements that, that Juno is making that kind of paint, paint a picture from multiple angles? Yes, actually. So, so Juno has this long, what is it, a 57-day orbit, okay? And it gets very close um, to Jupiter. And you get these great pictures from JunoCam. Check out the JunoCam website. Um, and, and our science instruments, like in the infrared, the ultraviolet, and particle instruments, get this, this view coming over the, the, the pole of Jupiter, the, the North Pole, and then coming out the South Pole. And uh, though they actually saw some evidence that, you know, May or so, it was extra bright in this or that, okay, but they only go by every 57 days, okay. And the advantage of the observations, the type of observations I do is I just, every day I open up and look at Jupiter and I take my measurements and then you know, I, I have this global view. So, so it does work together where something with global context can help these more point-like uh, or line-like measurements. So are you observing ev every night then? Like how, how frequent and how long have you been doing this? Okay, so I started in... Uh, let's see, February 2017, I, I got my filters from the filter manufacturer. That took like three months for them to build, They're very fancy filters. And within two weeks, I had the telescope up and running. Um, now, it wasn't, uh, you know, it, it was running, but I had to like stay up all night. And, and uh, yeah, I couldn't do that every day. 
Um, but gradually through 2017, I got it more sort of uh, just wake up a couple times a night. And, uh, and, and the weather in Arizona where this is hosted, I, I don't host it here, you know, too much snow. Um, uh, in Arizona, the weather's pretty good. Uh, so I got a lot of nights, uh, 150 so far. And, um, uh, and yeah, so I'm working towards more robotic observations. Because, well, I just got married in September, so I don't want to wake up my wife and stuff. So I'm, I'm curious about whether we can draw conclusions from, from IO and apply them to other places in the solar system. Because, you know, IO is kind of the only moon like it. Uh, in the solar system. But we have other moons, uh, like say Enceladus, where we see geysers of stuff coming off, maybe even Europa. In, in the Jupiter system, we're starting to see some potential that there's comets or Kuiper Belt objects that might have this kind of behavior. Is, is Io so different that there's not worth thinking about the others? Or are we seeing sort of different facets of a common uh, mechanism here? Well, for the moons that are orbiting giant planets, the primary mechanism that's operating is gravitational heating. Okay, so you've got Io in this gravitational dance with Europa and Callisto, and it gets perturbed in its orbit uh, by several thousand kilometers, and it gets squished like an anger ball. Okay, I don't know if you like being squished like an anger ball, but you know, Io doesn't, doesn't have sound that pleasant. 200 meter tides, surface tides, 200 meters, that's the calculation. That generates a lot of heat and energy. Now, out of Europa, you have the same effect going on. It's just not as dramatic because you're not as close to Jupiter. Uh, so that's why you have uh, evidence for liquid water or at least slush underneath the surface. And uh, um, these, these, these cool iceberg things that have rafted. And, and I remember when the DPS meeting where that was reported, this grad student had cut these things out and move them around, you know, everything I needed to know to be an astrophysicist I learned in kindergarten. Uh, so, and in Enceladus, it's the same deal. You've got this gravitational heating and uh, you get your geysers. Um, there's an interesting thing with Io though, uh, because it produces so much uh, material and that's in this big balloon of a magnetosphere, uh, it produces very uh, loud radio emission. That's actually the first evidence that we had about Jupiter's rotation period and, and it had a strong magnetic field and all that. It's kind of like a pulsar in a way. Well, there is uh, one of my colleagues, Philippe Zarka, uh, who's head of at least part of the LOFAR, um, that's just a large low frequency array, something like that, um, which is this huge radio telescope, many, many, you know, nodes. And uh, he's looking for these large radio bursts from an extrasolar planet. So, so that's one way that something as unusual as Jupiter, that might not be that unusual, uh, but as Io rather, as volcanic, um, might lead to detection of extrasolar planets. So do you have plans then to, like, to keep going, it sounds like? What are you looking for as, as you're going forward? Oh, well, okay, so one thing that I... Uh, that I found on this, you know, science makes progress a couple different ways. And one of them is, huh, that's weird. Um, so I had one of those moments on this when uh, this, this big, huge gas, you know, event happened and there was no infrared counterpart. See, one of the things that has been studied, and it's totally cool, like Keck Telescope and Gemini, they have these, these, um, uh, lasers that go up and uh, act like a guide star so they can correct the atmosphere. And they can actually see surface, well, hot spots on Io. Io is one arc second in diameter. I mean, that's like a, subdividing a hair. I mean, it's, it's really cool. Okay, so they can see these hot spots, but none of these hot spots got hotter. Or, okay, there was one small one around that time, but the timing might not have been quite right. So there was nothing convincingly huge. So, okay, all this gas came from something that wasn't a hot spot. Where did it come from? Can we see it with, with any technique? And uh, there are some uh, researchers at uh, Planetary Science Institute who were graduate students in the late 60s and early 70s. 
And they remember, this is even before volcanoes were discovered on Io. Somebody saw something change on Io when it went into eclipse and then when it came out. Uh, they called it post-eclipse brightening. Uh, Dale Crookshank was one of the people who did that. Famous planetary astronomer. They said, hey, Jeff, why don't you look for that? I'm like, uh, what? what? <laughs> okay. So then fast forward, and I, I detect this huge gas release, but no infrared counterpart. I'm like, oh, well, no one else is able to see anything. It kind of clicked. Why don't I look for, or, or maybe this post-eclipse brightening isn't an atmosphere collapse like people have been thinking all these years. Maybe it's a surface thing. Because there's, you know, like you might blurp out this SO2 frost. And anyway, these are some of the ideas that uh, these guys gave me. And so I got a couple filters and uh, in a couple of weeks I'll go and try it out. Pretty cool. Uh, we got to let you go soon. Before, before you do, uh, you want to tell people how they can learn more about what you're doing. You have a website or something that they should look up? Well, let's see. PSI put out a couple of press releases. Um, so you can go to the PSI website and look at uh, news stories. Um, there's also a PSI front page, which features the Mercury observation. The Mercury looks like a big comment if you look in just the right light. Uh, and um, actually, I do have plans. It's not, not for real yet, but I have plans to pl uh, make a website that, that um, shows the, the daily volcanic activity on Io. Uh, because it's cool, just because it's cool, but also uh, my fellow researchers could really stand to know that, um, to look for infrared counterparts, because sometimes they do seem to occur based on previous results. And if they're doing any magnetospheric work, radio, stuff like that, it sets a context. So in the future. Now, hopefully. before you escape, we do have one final question coming in from the audience. And that is, how do you cope with atmospheric disturbance? You explained how Keck does it, but you're using a bit different of a system. Okay, I will use some uh, some letters here for an equation. It's called the area solid angle effect. Okay, I'm looking at a big blob of gas. Okay, that sodium cloud is the largest object the largest permanent structure in the in the solar system okay i mean the, the solar wind is larger but it's always wiggling this thing is six degrees across okay you don't need a big telescope if the object you're studying is six degrees across in fact it was first observed with a four inch telescope so that's that's the cool thing and that's the cool thing about space physics is that you're studying these big bulbs of gas and we don't need huge telescopes to do it. And the real cool thing is it changes every day. Even every five minutes, I see something different with this hula hoop thing. We didn't even get to that. So anyway, thanks for the questions. Yeah, well, thank you so much for, for joining us, Jeff. It's always so exciting to see the kind of work that people could be doing with stuff they have in their, their closet. So uh, thank you so much for, for joining us and hope you'll come back the next time you find something. Okay, thanks so much for your time. Yeah. Have a great evening. Kimberly, um, you wanna tell us about the Kuiper Belt and what we're missing? Yeah, so the Kuiper Belt is such an interesting place in the solar system. It's this uh, ring of small icy bodies outside of Neptune uh, that we think is left over from the formation of the solar system. Uh, but one of the big unknowns is how much, how many big things are in the Kuiper Belt and how many small things are in the Kuiper Belt. And that can really tell us a lot about what the solar system looked like, what sort of things it started with four and a half billion years ago to help build the planets. Uh, and that's one of the most difficult questions for us to answer. Uh, Kuiper Belt objects, as we've talked about in the past, they're so they're relatively so small uh, and they're so very dim and hard to detect from here on Earth. So what uh, astronomers have started doing and have been doing for a while is finding indirect ways to figure out how many things of different sizes there are out in the Kuiper Belt. And they do that by looking at 
the impacts that they leave behind after they hit the surface of something else. And in this case, the something else is Pluto and Charon. Uh, and luckily for us, we sent a mission to the Pluto system just a couple of years ago, and took, which took amazing high resolution images of the surface surfaces of both of these objects. And one of the amazing new discoveries is that the types of craters that we see on the surface of Pluto and on Charon suggest that we're actually missing quite a few small objects in the Kuiper belt, specifically objects that are smaller than about one kilometer in diameter, uh, which would have left craters that were about 13 to 15 kilometers in size on the surface. Uh, and luckily New Horizons resolution was uh, much better than, than 15 kilometers per pixel. And we were able to find we, that we actually didn't see craters that matched smaller objects. We only saw ones that matched bigger objects. And in fact, things that were smaller than about, or craters that were smaller than about 10 kilometers, they just, they're barely even there. Much fewer than our current models of the Kuiper belt suggest. So they have a hypothesis about where they are? The answer is they don't exist. <laughs> That's sort of the answer there. Uh, but Why don't they exist? They don't exist um, because they, we think that they were all uh, accreted onto larger objects in the Kuiper belt. Um, so, I mean, I think we've spoken in the past that the universe is pretty good at making small things, but those small things very rapidly stick together and make bigger things. Uh, and that's probably what happened in the Kuiper belt. But what the, uh, what the second part of that is, is that those bigger things then did not collide with each other to remake more small things and repopulate the Kuiper belt with smaller things. So there's a two part, there's a two parter there is that the small things don't exist now because the collision rate in the Kuiper belt was probably much smaller, uh, much slower than space we thought. Space is big. Space is space big. Is things, big things don't yeah. collide nearly as much as things like Star Wars would suggest. So I wonder if we're going to see a similar conclusion then coming out of uh, 2014 MU69, um, you know, the pictures there seem like they'll be good enough to get at least simple cratering rates uh, for that part of space. And I'll be curious to see if, if that lines up with the story at, at Pluto. Yeah, I'm, I'm also interested about that as well. But some of the initial images we've seen of MU69 suggest that there aren't actually that many craters on the surface at all. Uh, which, which is, is part which of the is story, right? Part of the story, too. Um, Another one of the complications with Pluto, with Pluto and with Charon in particular, is that they're actually still geologically active, and so they had to uh, deal with the fact that if there had been small craters in the past, then they probably have been erased. Uh, and so that that was one a, a bit of the complication going in there. And there's some unknowns that have to do with you know how quickly the surface of Pluto refreshes itself and, and erases these craters, and they they sort of dealt with most of that and how the atmosphere may have filled in craters. And MU69 definitely would not have had any of those uh, uh, processes. In a way, I guess it's sort of good to know that they're not out there, since these are the kinds of things that we're basically never going to be able to find yeah, it's from true. Earth, even if if they were there. So it just saves us the trouble. Of, it does. Of and it, you them. know what else it tells us? It tells us the fact that any of the things we see in the Kuiper Belt likely are indeed left over from the start, the beginning of the solar system. Uh, they probably have not smashed into each other and changed their chemical uh, formulae uh, through these collisions. Their sizes, their shapes, and their compositions probably are pretty primordial. So we just need to lasso one and drag it back to, to Earth. From... Um, beyond the orbit of Neptune. Yeah, sure, totally. That's a thing we can do. <laughs> uh, speaking of bringing very large things uh, towards Earth, Pamela, you got some bad news for us about how we're going to save ourselves uh, from the worst. I, I do. And uh, it turns out that asteroids don't like to not be asteroids. If you what? attempt, If you attempt to blow up an asteroid... I'm I'm sorry, movie Armageddon. I have found yet more reasons for you to be wrong. Uh, asteroids are Pamela, you're you're destroying all my dreams right now. Like this is this was my backup plan if my current job didn't work was going to be Bruce Willis and destroying asteroids. I, and it's, I it's wanted, gone now. 
I wanted Tappy Star to be a mega structure, and you destroyed that dream. So now we are yeah. equal. Oh, it's getting low blows here. Um, low blow. So I said want. I said want. I didn't say I thought it was. Uh, but but anyway, so it turns out that asteroids, we knew they were held together through like the normal everyday chemical bonding things that like hold together rocks and the wood of my desk and me and things like that. And we knew that they were kind of loosely held together by gravity. But gravity always wins. And this is problematic because if you blow up an asteroid, three hours later, that rubble's come back together and is like, hi, I'm a new asteroid. It's still an asteroid. Three it's hours. now just in a different configuration. So, yeah, just hours. And if you want to defy that, you're pretty much going to have to vaporize that sucker. And we don't have the energy to do that. So, um, so lesson one, which wasn't part of this research paper, if you blow up an asteroid that's about to hit the Earth, instead of getting one giant crater, you get a ring of craters around the planet and destroy the whole world. Don't do that. Lesson number two, if the asteroid is far away and you decide to blow it up, because hey, why not? Uh, it's just going to reform, so don't bother. Uh, lesson number three, we don't have enough energy to do a better job, so don't try. Um, yeah, blowing up asteroids doesn't work. Don't try it. You might get a few but would, shards, but yeah. But would the redirect method still work? Would oh, we yeah. be able to get a give it enough energy to nudge it out of orbit and not destroy it? Changing its orbit is super easy, especially if it's well, changing its orbit is super easy, full stop. Changing its orbit enough that an object that's on a collision path with the Earth isn't going to hit the Earth. You can do it as long as you notice the object ahead of time. And what's cool is you can do it just by painting that asteroid white. Because sunlight, uh, if it is reflected off of the asteroid instead of absorbed in and heating it up, that transfer of momentum is enough to slowly nudge an asteroid into a new non-Earth destroying orbit. So let's just graffiti stuff. Banksy has the right idea. That's what we're going to learn from Osiris Rex, right? Yes, exactly. Not really. Yeah, but. Yes, the, the problem, <laughs> the problem is seeing them early enough. Like we learned it from Chelyabinsk that yeah. sometimes you just turn around and bam, there it is, and no, no amount of spray paint will save you. Then. Well, one one of the big issues that we have is the most destructive kinds of asteroids are the ones that are in highly elliptical orbits, which means that they're going to hit us from one of two directions. They're either essentially coming out of the midnight sky as they head in towards the sun, or they're coming out of the direction of the sun where we don't point telescopes. And it's these, these asteroids that are coming from the direction of the sun where we're not currently pointing telescopes. Those are the ones that we have to worry about. So the goal is to find them not when they're on the orbit that crosses the Earth's orbit where the Earth is, but to instead find them like perpendicular orbits where their highly elongated orbit is crossing over there, 90 degrees away from us around the orbit. And they're in the plane of the sky. They can be detected. And they're not actively trying to kill us. So... This is where we need the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope to complement the suite of instruments we already have, like the Las Campanas Survey, uh, the new Fritz Wiki uh, transient facility. We're looking. We're hopefully going to find them. And um, yeah, craters but if happen. We don't. We're not going not gonna to save ourselves with a bomb. No. No. Sleep tight, everyone. Uh, let's so Morgan, with, what's up on Mars? Yeah, let's stick with the rock theme. Uh, we've been tracking uh, the progress of InSight uh, since it launched and landed and deployed its instruments to the surface. And, and now it's actually starting to carry out those experiments. And sort of the, the signature experiment on InSight is to go down into the surface and make temperature measurements uh, to determine the heat flow out of Mars, basically. And if we can measure how fast heat is flowing out, then we can wind the clock back to figure out how much heat there must have been on the inside in the past. And that'll help us understand when the core might have been active enough to sustain a magnetic field, when all sorts of things could have been going on. 
Uh, but the key is getting that probe down into the ground. And for the best, uh, for the experiment to work as at its maximum, they want to drive that probe down five meters into the surface. Um, but that doesn't always work out. And so they designed the experiment to work even if they could get down to three meters. And they could sort of take more data, take a longer time, the data would be noisier, but they would get the result that they were needing. Uh, well, in the last couple of weeks, they've been driving that probe down. Uh, and it's currently stuck. And it's stuck at a depth of half a meter. That's uh, not which three meters. You, right, you might notice is less than three. Uh, and, you know, I think I always imagine when I think about this, I think of it as like a drill, but it, it's not really a drill. It's basically like a hammer. So you can imagine taking a stake and hammering it into the ground. And they do this for about four hours at a time. And then the pre probe has heated up by like 30 degrees Celsius. And they have to let it cool down for several days before they can hit it for four more hours. And they designed it such that if it runs into small rocks, it'll sort of eventually just kind of push them out of the way. It'll just slow down the rate of, of drilling. And they, they encountered a rock like that early on, and they were able to push it aside and, and keep going. Uh, now they've hit a, a harder rock, or at least a bigger rock, um, that is not seeming to, to give way. And so uh, the German space agency, which is managing this part of of the mission has decided to uh, pause and take a couple of weeks to sort of analyze the situation and do some experiments in the lab here at home before trying to figure out how to move move forward. And right now it's, it's a little uncertain about what's gonna happen. Um, at, so is this, a, is this a different type of rock than was expected or just a type of rock was expected, but much bigger than we thought. Well, I think they both expected rocks and even expected large rocks. It was just going to be kind of a random chance about whether they, they got one. They landed in sight in the area of Mars that they did right along the equator because uh, the measurements indicated that this was some of the softest ground in, um, in Mars, but this isn't like a beach. So, you know, imagine going out on Earth and trying to drive a stake five meters down into the ground. There's a good chance that you're going to hit a rock at, at some point. Uh, and so it's not, you know, this isn't mission over, uh, but they're stopping to think more about how they're going to proceed. And what I don't know, and I don't know, maybe one of, of you knows, is they deployed all this stuff to begin with by like placing it out on the surface. So I don't know if they hit a rock that they can't get past, can they just like pull the stake back out and try to jam it in uh, another place? This, this I is, don't, I don't know. I, I don't know either. And this is one of those questions that I've been trying to find an answer and Google has failed me. Jeff, do you happen to know we have another planetary scientist? <laughs> You're muted. <laughs> I, I'm just Googling Insight Move Probe, and I, it's already, that's the best I can do. Oh, no. My instincts tell me that they can't actually move the lander itself right now. Not the lander. Uh, just pull not the, the lander. out by but the I tether. No, I know. Because my first thought was, why don't you just pick it up and move it somewhere else where there isn't a rock? Yeah. Uh, but I don't know how mobile the actual uh, the hammer mechanism is. I don't know how much oh. flexibility and they have wonder. there. Yeah, you wonder if they, they, the answer is no, but they're still going to find a way to do it anyway. True. Uh, like, true. I've been, you know, they've had to change how Curiosity's drill works. Before, it was supposed to sort of go in contact with the rock, and then it would stick the drill bit out and kind of brace itself against the rock and, and drill in. But that extending mechanism is basically stuck. And so they worked it all the way out, and now they just start the drill and kind of like serial killer style, just kind of like stab at the rock with it to to drill in and it works but that was never the point of of the instrument and so you wonder if if it does get stuck and they can't get it through if they're try something totally unplanned to to work past it uh, but this was always one of the gambles in fact sort of the gamble with insight every mission has that thing that you want to try but you're not sure it's going to work and this is that and unfortunately we've at least found ourselves going down that path. Um, but 
they're, they're going to work on it for a few weeks and we'll be back with hopefully some better news about getting down a little farther. And, and one Man, of the problems about potentially pulling it back out by the tether is during its first hammering run and these are like only four hours in duration and four thousand hammers because it gets hot as as morgan pointed out and uh during that four hours of pounding it at one point tilted over 15 degrees so this little hammering burrowing thermal gear is tilting and tipping and wending its way down in a not entirely straight line. Yeah, well, you think that might help with skirting, skipping over a rock, but maybe make it harder to pull out. And we've all tried to drive a crooked nail uh, into a board, and that's a path towards madness, even if you can see the nail and the board. You know what would help? One of those Hayabusa-style projectile projectile things shoot mars yeah they should have just used a gun so this got to drive a pilot hole first but it it actually kind of works that way if you think about it they they aren't hammering this from above this is a system where they they essentially have something that is shaped like a chisel and inside has a hammering device that they slowly pull up and then slam down and that so slamming now. down process moves the entire thing downwards and then they pull it back up and slam it and and so they're essentially firing the hammer four thousand times in four hours it's That's like a crazy. repeating staple gun uh they call it, they're calling it the mole which yeah, just makes the hammer. life of a mole sound it's essentially really, a jackhammer really yeah it's essentially yeah, a basically jackhammer. A self, okay. self jacking hammer yeah <laughs> well uh best wishes to insight as it continues on and one way or the other we'll be talking about this again uh in a couple of weeks uh, but for the moment i want to talk about human space flight too the space station. How close are we, Pamela? I uh, hopefully five months. Um, theoretically four months, but I'm always pessimistic. Uh, so we're looking at mid July if everything goes well. Uh, we currently have docked at the International Space Station uh, the Crew Dragon capsule. It flew there with the Ripley uh, autonomous artificial human that is packed full of sensors and inside of one of the very stylish SpaceX space suits. And uh, they're planning to uh, disembark from the ISS this Friday at a horribly early hour of the morning. They are going to fire their re-entry engines, come down, and uh, with four separate parachutes, if all goes well, descend into a small rectangle that is actually overlapping with the region where they had their booster land. So uh, they're going to be bringing two different things in. Now, they aren't going to use the barge. Of course, I still love you. They have a different... Uh, spacecraft that they're going to be using to scoop up the capsule not spacecraft a different ship that they're going to be using to scoop up the capsule it kind of looks like if james bond was designing uh spacex and uh we will be bringing that to you live on twitch on the cosmo quest x channel now if all four parachutes and everything else goes well if all the re-entry burn went well before that, if this is as flawless as things have been so far, or at least nominal, it's space, nominal's good enough. Uh, then in June, they're going to be doing an exceedingly dramatic abort test. The current plan is to shut off the engines at max Q and see if the capsule automatically on its own decides, oh, I need to abort and save the lives of probably Ripley, I'm hoping Ripley, or another autonomous non-human on board and fly that autonomous non-human in a spacesuit back to the planet as stages one and two shred themselves to pieces 
There is a fabulous article on Parabolic Arc about this where they have uh, gotten their hands on the environmental impact study that was done to make sure that this was a safe abort test to be doing. Um, I don't know how safe it is, but oh my gosh, it's going to be dramatic. And uh, if that also goes safely, then in July, it's two humans are going to be launching flying to the ISS, staying there for two weeks, and coming back. So correct me if I'm wrong, that'll be the first commercial human crew launched into space and then brought back. Virgin Galactic yeah. might argue, but it will be the first to, the to space lower station, orbit. Virgin Galactic too. Yeah, I'm happy to go with Virgin Galactic uh, made it um, suborbital, and this is the first orbital. And this okay. is going to be essentially 10 years since the last space shuttle launch. So this so, will be the, the first time we're, we're launching humans from the U.S. into in, orbit. In 10 years. In 10 years. And strangely enough, all of this excitement to get back to low Earth orbit occurs 50 years after we first walked on the moon. Wee. <laughs> What I thought was so cool about this test is that when the space shuttle used to dock at the space station, mm -hmm. it took four astronauts on board the shuttle plus astronauts on board the space station yeah. to coordinate that docking attempt. They all had their little lever and their uh, screen. And, and when Crew Dragon docked, it did it entirely autonomously, uh, which we sort of come to expect from all sorts of things in our lives but is unheard of for a spacecraft to, to do this. Even the normal dragon that delivers cargo doesn't do this. They you, you use an astronaut to sort of snatch it with the arm. Uh, this seal, feels like it's ushering in a new era of, of space docking. And, and to be entirely fair to the poor space shuttle, that was 1960s technology, 1980s on a good day. And the... Uh, Dragon Cargo capsule is 10-year-old technology. Crew Dragon is new and has the advantage of having better AIs than we've ever had before. So uh, we may not be welcoming our robot overlords as quickly as we'd like, but we certainly are welcoming our AI overlords. Oh, and the inside is, show, is so shiny. It's, it's like true. 2001 actually came real. And the inside is all gleamy and glossy. And it's like a J.J. Abrams film in there. It, it, I, I would say this is like if J.J. Abrams got to design NASA. Um, I, I even saw a few lens flares on the SpaceX coverage. <laughs> but we didn't talk about my favorite part about this story is that along with Ripley, there was a tiny little stuffed plushie of the Earth. And I happen to have the matching stuffed plushie of Pluto and Sharon that went to the space station. That's the my Earth favorite one, part. The Earth and the Moon holding hands. Well, no, it's Pluto and Sharon holding hands. Well, and loving no, each the other. one that was on. Oh, it was just the, the Earth. Spaceship. It was just, it was just, just the Earth. Oh. Yeah, uh, but same line of of stuffed animals, and I happen to have one. So that's my favorite part of this story. <laughs> All right, Kimberly, uh, take us home here with. A really new confirmation of a really old thing? Yeah, so this is sort of one of those really fun, well, uh, okay, fun for me, heartwarming stories that uh, goes way back into the very first year that Kepler was in space, the very first planet candidate that Kepler detected. Ten years later, it is finally confirmed to actually be a planet. Yay. And it was uh, done by a so, grad student. And it was done by a grad student. Go grad students. You're awesome. Uh, so what the story is behind this is that uh, this, this planet candidate was called KOI-4. It was the first one that Kepler detected. Uh, the first three KOIs were known beforehand, before Kepler launched. This is the first from Kepler. Uh, it was detected. Uh, it was originally thought uh, that the star was much smaller, and so the signal that they were detecting couldn't possibly have been a planet. Uh, and so it was sort of stuck in the planet stage, and then it was, we reanalyzed, and then it became a false positive detection, so it definitely wasn't a planet. 
And then we reanalyzed it again and recharacterized uh, the size of the star. And we said, oh, maybe it, maybe it, maybe it's a planet. And then it was a false positive again. And then we, then just recently, there were new, uh, new data about the star itself. Uh, and they took uh, seismological measurements of the star. They did astro seismology to actually get a, a good, accurate measurement of the size of the star. It was much bigger than we thought it was originally, which means that the planet is also much larger than we thought it was. And it was definitely a planet. And then they went and they got archival radial velocity data to confirm it. Now that they knew what the star was, they could go back and look at the archives of radial velocity and figure out what the planet was. So now we know that the star is very big. It's uh, much larger, much hotter than the sun is. It's actually an evolved star. It's not a main sequence star, but it's a subgiant uh, that has a hot Jupiter planet in a 3.8 day orbit. Uh, and so this is the one of the very few times we've actually detected an exoplanet around an evolved star. And it's the it's has the shortest orbital period that we've detected uh, for an exoplanet around a subgiant star. And this is a star that's basically what the sun will look like in a couple billion years. Uh, and it took 10 years to get to this point, which I just think is really cool. Yeah. We're still discovering really awesome stuff with Kepler data going back even to the very first Kepler planet candidate. So it seems like there must be tons of Kepler candidate planets or just candidate exoplanets out there yeah. that people are never gonna do this amount of work for. And especially as we go forward and we find more and more and more, it seems like there's going to be this sort of purgatory class of, of things where you just describe cross-referencing this observation with that one, with this one, with that one, just to prove that it's, it's real. You know, are people going to do that for every planet that we think we might have found? For every planet, maybe not. Uh, a lot of these planets will fall into the efforts of um, doing large, big batches of reanalysis as we get better and better archives uh, and we um, we gather all of the disparate measurements together into catalogs it'll become a lot easier to just take you know the next hundred kepler planet candidates that we haven't had time to look through uh, and do a deeper dig on them now that we're getting more consolidated data access uh, and yeah we're gonna be we're gonna be doing this for a while uh, I mean, this one, this particular planet candidate has a really good story behind it in that it was the first one and it's gone back and forth and back and forth. It's been so controversial and now we know. And so it's a great story, but we're going to keep doing this for more than just, you know, the interesting ones. Um, we're going to be going through the Kepler archive for still many years. Someday this is just so going to be a giant database query. It's just going to be yeah. a merge on RAN DAC and see, okay, what is the actual size? It's just a database query. Well, in yeah. some ways that kind of reminds me of what we've seen in the last 25 years with Hubble, is people keep going back into the archival Hubble data and pulling out more and more stuff as we get more a longer baseline and better processing algorithms and faster computers. You know, Kepler will keep giving for a, a long time. Yeah, and I think one of the things this story also highlights a lot is that most of the stuff that we know about exoplanets is all dependent on what we actually know about the stars. Because aside from a very few handful of planets, all of our detections of exoplanets and our confirmations are all indirect. And the thing we're actually measuring is the star in some way, shape, or form. And so, you know, we think we know a lot about the, you know, almost 4,000 confirmed planets that we have, uh, but we don't we we know them as well as we know their stars. And in this case, it wasn't very well until just recently. <laughs> All right. Well, for our very last story, it's be a quick one. I, I want to just kind of gush for a moment about this new Apollo Eleven documentary uh, that I was ranting about on on Twitter this weekend after I I saw it, and I'm saying it now because it's in theaters like this week and then not again until the summer. And it's basically only being screened in IMAX theaters. And it's the kind of thing that you wanna go and see on the biggest possible screen that, that you can find because it's, it's just extraordinary. It's all it is, is an hour and a half of footage from the launch to the landing 
of Apollo 11 with no narration, just uh, clips from the NASA uh, announcers and things and uh, scientists and things going along along the way. And it's footage in, in some cases no one's ever seen before. And it, it turns out that, you know, it, on Earth, they had all of these Hollywood grade cameras on dollies doing all of this filming in every stage of of the mission and then basically just box that stuff up for 50 years. And they had all these cameras on the spacecraft in angles and places that you've never seen them before that were never sort of properly digitized for, for the modern age. And the footage is, is so good that it just seems, it seems fake sometimes. It's just so extraordinary. And it's I, not, we went to the moon. We went to the moon, but uh, I, mean, I was talking to my parents about it today, and we sort of agreed that if you were want to believe that the moon landings were a hoax, this film is like proof that that was true, because it seems so perfect that it couldn't possibly have happened. Um, but it did. And, but it did. Uh, and I just can't say enough. This year, sort of going through the summer with the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11 is just going to be moon, moon, moon all, all the rest of the year. And if there's one thing that you see this year around these events, uh, this is the one to see because it, it really is uh, just extraordinary. And, and go out and find it. And if you miss it this week, look for it again over the summer. You've been warned. <laughs> uh, with that, before we uh, find out what... Uh, Kimberly and Pamela have been up to this week. I want to offer a shout out to our very best friends in the universe, the Weekly Space Hangout crew, which uh, has been setting up a brand new shiny website with a forum and uh, a heart and, <laughs> and all of that stuff. They are the people who help us line up guests like Jeff. I don't think that any of us knew three weeks ago that Jeff was going to be our, our guest, except for the producers and uh, the people who went out and contacted him and, and found him. So if you have scientists out there that you think are really cool, or if you have people who are doing um, science adjacent stuff, writing books, doing podcasts, uh, singing songs, uh, reach out to them. Tell them that there's an amazing group of people out there who want to hear from them, want to share in the work that they're doing, and, and then point them our way. Uh, and if you want to find out about this amazing group of people, you can head over to wshcrew.space, and everything you'd ever want to know is, is there waiting for you. So thank you, crew. We live to serve you, and uh, we have fun doing it every week. Uh, Pamela, what have you been up to lately? I have been, oh my gosh, streaming all the things. It feels like um, there's so much getting launched, landed, poked, prodded by spacecraft right now that it sometimes feels like it is a race to keep up with everything that is going on. Uh, so if you don't know where to find me, check on Twitch because I'm probably covering some spacecraft somewhere that is doing awesome. And Speaking of spacecraft doing awesome, we uh, got a I Can't Show You complete mosaic of Bennu that we have set up in CosmoQuest in a locked off site that is being tested and poked at by the OSIRIS-REx team. And we're gearing up to find that rock that we're going to bring home with our little spacecraft. Uh, Hayabusa 2 is doing an amazing job. It's going to be touching down, grabbing rocks from hopefully three different sites. It already reached out and grabbed rocks from one of them. Um, and when she's done, well, then it's going to be Osiris Rex's turn. So I've been coding, I've been streaming, and I have been living in the science. Kimberly, what have you been up to? Oh, so I've been learning about a really cool new seismological technique to detect earthquakes that uses old dark fiber optic cables left over in the ground from the 1990s. There's a new method that's emerging in seismology that is taking those dark fiber networks and turning them into 
like regional seismographs to detect earthquakes. And so that's what I've been learning all about this week. And you can read about it soon on eos.org uh, or uh, I will, I'm sure I will be gushing about it on Twitter at Astro Kim Cartier. It's really cool. <laughs> Jeff, you've stuck with us silently all episode, so thank you for that. Uh, you been up to anything particularly cool uh, this last couple of weeks? Well, it was really cool to listen to you guys. Uh, that's that's nice. I don't normally watch TV, you know, or, or participate in media. You know, the world could end and I wouldn't know it. Uh, but uh, uh, well, I've been watching my son grow, and that's cool. That sounds like something that's worth turning off the TV for. As always, I'm Morgan Renberg. Fraser will be back to rescue us next week. Have a good night, everybody. Bye-bye.